to this point, we've been describing what happens when you digest and absorb carbohydrates into our blood. But then what happens next? How do we store and transport those carbohydrates between tissues that need them? In this video, we're going to describe what happens to glucose after it traffics through the enterocyte. We're going to talk about the major tissues that are responsible for postprandial glucose disposal and how this can be affected by insulin resistance and diabetes. We're going to separate the roles of exercise and insulin in glucose disposal in the muscle. And then we're going to use an oral glucose tolerance test and interpret to be able to classify whether an individual is normal glycemic, pre-diabetic, or diabetic. The levels of glucose in the blood are controlled by three processes. The first is how quickly and to the extent we absorb glucose from our small intestine into our blood. A second source of glucose is the production of glucose by the liver and the kidneys. Those are balanced by the uptake and disposal of glucose into target tissue, muscle, fat, liver, brain. If we follow what happens to glucose after a meal, you get a graph like the one shown here on the left. Focus in on the controls. What you can see is that after a meal, the vast majority of glucose is disposed of in skeletal muscle. Smaller amounts are disposed of in adipose tissue and in the brain. Now critically, for somebody who has type 2 diabetes, you can see that it is the muscle glucose disposal that is the most attenuated. That means that it is the inability to transport glucose into muscle that is the cause of hyperglycemia for individuals in type 2 diabetes after a meal. So how does this happen? Well, there are two different stimuli that can promote glucose disposal. After a meal, glucose stimulates the release of the hormone insulin from the pancreas. Insulin then drives the transport of glucose into muscle and adipose tissue. Insulin also promotes the storage of glucose as glycogen. Another mechanism by which glucose disposal is promoted is through exercise. In this case, an energy demand promotes the transport of glucose into muscle tissue. If we look at this at a molecular level, the key transporter in this process of transport into muscle is called GLUT4. Normally, GLUT4 is sequestered on vesicles inside the cell and not on the plasma membrane. However, upon insulin stimulation, GLUT4 vesicles are trafficked to the plasma membrane where they then fuse. Now that GLUT4 are on the plasma membrane, they allow glucose to go down its concentration gradient inside the cell. This occurs primarily in muscle and adipose tissue. Insulin-stimulated GLUT4 translocation is therefore critical for getting glucose into muscle in adipose tissue after a meal. But what about exercise? Well, it turns out exercise uses GLUT4 as well. Upon stimulation of exercise and an induction of energy demand, GLUT4 storage vesicles are translocated into the plasma membrane, again allowing glucose to enter the cell down its concentration gradient. Now critically, the mechanisms by which energy expenditure connects to GLUT4 transport are totally distinct from the mechanisms by which insulin stimulates glucose transport. This is actually a benefit. This means that even if you are insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic, exercise stimulated glucose disposal can still be an effective way of managing glucose levels. Once inside the cell, glucose is stored as a carbohydrate called glycogen. The synthesis of glycogen is promoted by insulin. Glycogen is a polysaccharide containing alpha-1,4 and alpha-1 linkages of glucose. Glucose can also be converted into lipids, primarily in adipose tissue. Now importantly, there is no storage polysaccharide for fructose or galactose. That means that fructose and galactose in our diet must either be used for energy, converted into glucose, or converted into lipids. But it cannot be stored as a polysaccharide containing only fructose or galactose. So what happens if glucose is not effectively taken up by our tissue? Well, that means after a meal, it stays in our bloodstream. This can have devastating consequences for people and is diagnosed often by something called an oral glucose tolerance test. So let's go through what that would look like. The participant is told not to eat or drink anything except for water for at least eight hours before. They are then told to ingest 75 grams of glucose in liquid form. And their levels of blood glucose are monitored for two hours. In the middle, you can see the results of a normal and a diabetic subject. In the normal subject, you can see there is a transient increase in blood glucose which then declines as glucose is transported first into the blood and then out of the blood by insulin-stimulated GLUT4 translocation. However, in the diabetic subject, glucose levels rise and stay elevated for a long period of time. The American Diabetes Association sets guidelines for cutoffs to diagnose somebody as either pre-diabetic or diabetic, depending on the levels of blood glucose both at the fasting level and two hours after the start of the oral glucose tolerance test. Somebody whose blood glucose levels stay at above 200 milligrams per deciliter two hours after ingestion are diagnosed as diabetic. 
Now there are two aspects for which this can go wrong. One is, after you ingest glucose, is enough insulin produced by the beta cells of the pancreas? This is the case for people with type 1 diabetes, where they are unable to produce sufficient insulin. However, the majority of people with diabetes are what's called type 2 diabetes. They are generally able to produce sufficient amounts of insulin, but their body does not respond to insulin. That makes them insulin resistant. This means that after a meal, insulin is produced, but their body does not respond effectively to insulin. In either case, this results in glucose staying in the blood and not being able to get into the cell. In summary, after ingestion, glucose is transported from the blood into muscle, liver, and adipose tissue by insulin-dependent processes. The key transporter for muscle and adipose tissue is called GLUT4. It is normally sequestered inside the cell, but can translocate to the plasma membrane upon proper stimuli. Exercise, as well as insulin, can promote glucose transport into muscle, but exercise and insulin have distinct mechanisms by which they promote GLUT4 translocation. This can be leveraged to help use exercise to control blood glucose even when insulin action is impaired. Impaired glucose disposal results in glucose levels staying elevated in the blood after a meal. This can be diagnosed by an oral glucose tolerance test, and there are cutoffs that can be used to diagnose an individual with diabetes or prediabetes depending on how long their blood glucose levels stay elevated.